Good evening. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to the 2007 Priestly Celebration. Each year since 1952, we have gathered to present this award to a distinguished scientist in memory of Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen and an early friend of Dickinson College. The presentation of this award gives us the occasion to commemorate Dickinson's revolutionary heritage. It also symbolizes our strong commitment to the advancement of sciences as an integral and central focus of the liberal arts curriculum. Our commitment to science is, in fact, assuming a vibrant physical presence on campus with the construction of our new state-of-the-art interdisciplinary science complex, or campus, which will open in the summer of 2008 and will position us for leadership in the 21st century. As many of you know, our founder, Dr. Benjamin Rush, was a true revolutionary in many aspects of his life. Rush was not only a leader in the fight for American independence, but he also championed causes such as the, the um, abolition of slavery, the education of women, and care for the mentally ill. Rush was equally forward-looking in his thoughts on education and in his vision for Dickinson College. To Rush, a broadly educated citizenry was absolutely essential to the success of the new republic. Dickinson students were, however, to receive an education that was markedly different from that offered in Europe. The new nation demanded a new approach to education, and Dickinson College was founded with the express purpose of developing a distinctively American liberal arts education. A Dickinson liberal arts education, according to Rush, was to be ultimately useful the curriculum would encourage students to make connections among diverse disciplines and to push actively at the frontiers of knowledge. As the country's foremost physician, Rush instinctively knew the role that scientific knowledge and discovery would play in shaping the new nation. And he, in fact, expected science to play a central organizing role in Dickinson's curriculum. It was the sciences, Rush firmly believed, that would help students most readily connect creatively and imaginatively to emerging knowledge. It was the sciences that would ultimately create new fields of thought that crossed and merged existing disciplines. Indeed, Dr. Rush selected the telescope to represent knowledge on the college official seal. Science and exploration thus were invested with extreme importance in American liberal arts education. It should come as no surprise that Dr. Rush actively sought out other revolutionary thinkers of the day. One of them was Joseph Priestley. Priestley had been born near Leeds, England in 1733. Although he prepared for a career in the ministry, he had a deep and active fascination with science. After meeting Benjamin Franklin in London, Priestley conducted a series of experiments on electricity. Later, he turned to investigations of what he termed different types of air, explorations that led to the discovery of sulfur dioxide, ammonia, and a gas later named oxygen. Priestley's increasingly unorthodox views on theology, coupled with his outspoken opposition to the English slave trade, ultimately forced him to flee to America in 1794. Already well known for his scientific accomplishments, it was only a matter of time before Priestley would form a close friendship with the new nation's foremost physician, Benjamin Rush. Rush's letters contain numerous references to, this, who, to his delightful dinners and encounters with his new acquaintance, Joseph Priestley. Priestley was every bit as dedicated to improving the condition of humankind as Rush, even visiting Rush in Philadelphia at the height of the yellow fever epidemic, where Rush had remained to attend to the urban poor without pay who had the disease. The conversations between Rush and Priestley reflect the wide-reaching explorations of two extraordinary minds as they speculate on everything from the existence of an afterlife, the possibility of human flight, and the importance of taking one's pulse as a measure of health. Although Dr. Priestley died only 10 years after arriving in America, his relationship with Rush and his connection to Dickinson College continued when his friend Thomas Cooper was appointed the first professor of natural, hist uh, natural philosophy and chemistry in 1811 with the strong support of Dr. Rush. Interestingly, Thomas Jefferson had been actively recruiting Cooper for the University of Virginia for its first professor. 
Virginia's board, however, rejected Cooper as being too radical, but not Dickinson. With Cooper's subsequent arrival at Dickinson, the college established its first formal science department. Cooper was as much of a revolutionary thinker as Joseph Priestley and Benjamin Rush, and his forward-thinking political and religious views made his relations with Dickinson's rather pious president, Jeremiah Atwater, particularly contentious. His relationship with Atwater, who was, by the way, the first president of Middlebury College, became so strained that Cooper would remain at the college for only three years. Although his time at Dickinson was relatively short, Cooper left a lasting legacy by arranging for the acquisition of much of Priestley's scientific apparatus, thereby ensuring that Dickinson students would have state-of-the-art scientific equipment with which to work, learn, and advance society. The same equipment is still in the Dickinson College archives. The Dickinson College Award in memory of Joseph Priestley honors a distinguished scientist for discoveries that contribute to the betterment of humankind. This occasion is indeed a celebration of the human mind. It is a celebration of Dickinson's historic legacy and his strong commitment to scientific education and advancement. It is a celebration of scientific achievement, creativity, and vision that is carried on in the Priestley tradition by those distinguished individuals who are selected to receive this prestigious, uh, prestigious award. Individuals such as Carl Sagan, Margaret Mead, Linus Pauling, Glenn Seaborg, Edward Teller, Stephen J. Gould, Francis Crick, Leon Letterman, Edward O. Wilson, Jacqueline Barton, and many others, all Priestley Award recipients at Dickinson College. It is also a celebration of the contributions of these revolutionary thinkers who are not reticent to speak out on issues and to push the existing boundaries of knowledge with seemingly unorthodox views, and by so doing, help create a more just and compassionate society for future generations, a society that is in communication. It is therefore particularly appropriate that we honor this year's recipient, Dr. Vinton G. Cerf, for his pioneering work in computer science and information technology. The revolutionary nature of information technology and the useful sharing of information is as important today as it was during the days of Dr. Priestley. Indeed, some people make the claim, mostly I do, that uh, Dr. Rush was America's first networker. Through technology, though technology has come to represent a much different idea in our present day time, it is fitting that we have with us tonight Father of the Internet. It is our honor to recognize such revolutionary leadership and a person who truly permitted the world to connect and to a most serious point. I also hope that Dr. Cerf can enlighten us at some point this evening as to whether his name is in fact the source for the expression surf the net <laughs> or this association is but myth. That most democratic internet reference guide, Wikipedia, states, and students, please don't get any idea that I'm using this with authority. <laughs> this is rhetoric, all right? At least I know what I'm you know, doing at the time here. Rumor has it, and I'm quoting, that the term surfing the net, S-U-R-F-I-N-G, the net, originated from the first data sent over the internet by Vint Cerf during his time at DOD. But this is just urban myth. Gene Armour Polly popularized the term surfing the net in an essay, and the founders of SurfNet, C-E-R-F-Net, originally intended it to be spelled SurfNet, S-U-R-F-N-E-T. But that name was taken by a Dutch research company, so they called themselves the, now very catchy, California Education and Research Foundation Network, or SurfNet. Well, what is one to believe. <laughs> Nevertheless, I would now like to ask our uh, Professor Grant Brout, Associate Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science, to come to the podium to introduce our honoree and our speaker this evening. Grant? Thank you, President Durden. 
Uh, my first order of business, I was told, is to request that all cell phones and pagers be turned on to silent mode. So if you've got one of those that's not set that way, uh, please do that now. Okay, with that out of the way, I'd like to thank you all for coming here this evening uh, to help us honor this year's recipient of the Joseph Priestley Award, Dr. Vinton Cerf. We are recognizing Dr. Cerf for his pioneering role in the creation of the internet, as well as his continued vision and leadership on technical, social, and political issues in the internet arena. Dr. Cerf obtained his bachelor's degree in mathematics at Stanford University and his MS and PhD in computer science at UCLA. After earning his PhD, he returned to Stanford with a faculty appointment in computer science and electrical engineering. This is where, in 1972, he began working with his colleague, Robert Kahn, on the ideas that would lead to their development of the transmission control protocol and the internet protocol. These protocols, commonly referred to as TCP IP, govern the flow of information on the internet today, including every email that is sent, every instant message that is sent, every web page that is visited, every song that is downloaded, every telephone call that is made over a voice over IP service. In his career, Dr. Sheriff has continued to make significant contributions. As Vice President of Digital Information Services at MCI, he was responsible for design and implementation of the MCI mail system, the first commercial email system on the internet. He was the founding president of the Internet Society and set as its goal the continued development, promotion, and use of the Internet for the benefit of people throughout the world. He has spoken out on important issues, serving on the Information Technology Advisory Council for the President of the United States, and providing testimony to Congress on the importance of passing network neutrality legislation to safeguard the Internet against anti-competitive and discriminatory practices by network providers. For his contributions, he has been awarded the National Medal of Technology by President Bill Clinton, the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George Bush, and the Alan M. Turing Award by the Association for Computing Machinery. The Library of Congress has recognized him as a living legend. And in 1994, People Magazine named him one of the world's 25 most intriguing people. Dr. Scherf's most recent position is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google Incorporated. His acceptance of this position was announced with a headline that matches the license plate that he has on his car. It reads, Surf's Up. <laughs> In this role, he is helping Google to identify, define, and build the next generation of Internet applications, a set of applications which he predicts will drive the Internet to wider spread use than television, radio or phones, and will ultimately expand beyond planet Earth. Now, whether it's a desire to fulfill this prediction, part of his job as an internet evangelist, or more likely because it's a compelling and challenging project, he is part of a team of computer scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory who are developing an interplanetary network. Designed for communicating with space probes, as well as astronauts, such a network may one day also provide exceptional educational opportunities for students. From his role in the birth of the internet to his continued efforts guiding, protecting, promoting, and expanding it, it is clear that recognition as one of the fathers of the internet could not be more appropriate. Now please join me in welcoming this year's recipient of the Joseph Priestley Award, Dr. Vinton Cerf. Good evening, and thank you very much for a most kind introduction and a warm welcome here on this beautiful fall day. Uh, I have to persuade Mr. Jobs, and I'm legitimate here, so let's see how this works out. Well, in theory, that should be on the screen. Can I get some help from the uh, AV guys? There we are. Thank you. Uh, First of all, President Durden, thank you very, very much for uh, that uh, delicious introduction. Uh, it is, in fact, the case that my name is only accidentally associated with surfing the net, but it's a great and wonderful coincidence. 
Uh, when they asked me if I was willing to have the surf net named after me, my first reaction was, well, gee, what if they screw it up? It might be embarrassing. Uh, then I thought, well, you know, people name their kids after other people, and if the kids don't turn out right, they don't blame the people they named them after. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, what the heck? So in July of 1989, I flew out to San Diego, and we uh, took one of those uh, plastic bottles of uh, champagne they use in Hollywood, you know, full of glitter, and we smashed it over a Cisco router to launch the network. <laughs> and later, it was, the company was acquired, it was, it was started by General Atomics, the company was acquired by a company called TCG, uh, which was later acquired by AT&T. AT&T later decided that they would simply rename all of their things AT&T Net, and so I called them up while I was still at MCI and asked if I could buy SurfNet from them, and they refused, so, uh, because we were competitors. Uh, and at this point, considering the uh, debates on net neutrality, I think if I called them up and tried again, they would probably refuse again. So much for that theory. Um, I have to tell you that uh, this is an extraordinary uh, honor for me. And when you listed some of the other recipients, I had a little trouble recognizing myself in, uh, in such uh, exalted company. But I do recall a very important story that a friend of mine uh, tells about Joseph Priestley. Uh, he said that uh, it's, it was understood that, uh, that Dr. Priestley uh, discovered oxygen and in so doing make, made it much easier for everyone to breathe. <laughs> and so uh, we owe him a great deal, I think, for that. Uh, I'm also uh, particularly uh, attracted to the fact that uh, the uh, American Chemical Society is active in the Priestley Award uh, uh, ceremonies. Uh, I might have been a chemist at one time. When I was in high school, it was my favorite subject, uh, along with mathematics. Uh, and uh, I remember taking the ACS um, exams in 1961, and I placed 24th, I think, in the state of California. But uh, by that time, I had already been badly infected by computing and the whole idea of being able to create these virtual worlds that were under your control, in theory. And so I went on at Stanford not into chemistry, but to mathematics and, and computing. In any case, it's a real honor to be here uh, and to be the recipient of this very important award. Let me begin uh, by uh, explaining something about my title. Uh, when uh, I offered to, uh, to join Google, I sent an email to my good friend uh, Eric Schmidt, whom I had known for some 25 years, and it was a short email. I said, do you want some help? And he sent an email back saying, yes. That was the shortest interview I've ever had. Um, so on the appointed day uh, when I came to work at Google, I thought, well, with this, oh, by the way, I didn't ask for this title. They said, what title do you want? And I said, well, uh, how about Archduke? <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty cool title. They explained to me, though, that first it didn't fit very well in their nomenclature. And second, uh, they reminded me that the uh, earlier Archduke Ferdinand had been uh, assassinated in 1914, and it started World War I. So maybe this wouldn't be a really good title to have. And they persuaded me that given the 30-plus years that I had spent trying to get more internet built, that Chief Internet Evangelist might be an appropriate title. So uh, I accepted this uh, special honorific. Uh, and then I thought, well, I should wear something ecclesiastical on my first day. <laughs> and uh, looking in my closet, I discovered the formal academic robes of the University of the Balearic Islands in Spain. This is, this is not uh, any kind of artificial outfit. This is truly the academic robes of that uh, college. And so I thought, well, that looked pretty ecclesiastical. So I showed up in this outfit, and Eric took this picture uh, when we were uh, sitting uh, in our first day. I tried to, uh, to go down uh, during lunchtime to introduce myself to the Googlers, and you understand most of them. The average age there was 25 until I came there, and it's now 26. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I thought I would try to introduce myself to, uh, to the um, Googlers, and uh, the, uh, the older ones, of, of which there are a few, uh, sort of got the humor in all this, but the younger ones had a lot of trouble dealing with this outfit. 
Some of them just didn't want to look. You know, I don't even want to believe there's anybody dressed like that. Uh, and when I would go over to introduce myself and shake hands, they'd back up. Uh, one person said, what are you selling? And so uh, I haven't worn this again uh, at, uh, on the campus, but I'm sure those of you, especially on the faculty, will appreciate there are rare occasions when such garb can actually be literally and, and legitimately worn. So I, I always look forward to coming on campuses during graduation ceremonies where I can uh, address, uh, uh, dress appropriately for the occasion. Well, let me uh, get into the meat of uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight. And start first with some statistics about the internet in the last 10 years. If I were standing here in 1997, I would be quite excited to say that there were 22 million server computers on the network and 50 million users, which seemed like a lot at the time. Ten years later, the number of machines on the network is uh, nearly 500 million, and these are servers. This is email servers, web servers, and so on. These are not the episodically connected laptops and personal digital assistants, and over 1.1 billion users. Of course, that number, while it seems large, is actually quite small relative to the world's population. And so the chief internet evangelist has another 5.5 billion converts to make uh, before the work is done. Uh, in the same time frame is of this last 10 years, another phenomenon has evolved in the telecommunications industry, and that is mobile communication. There are estimated to be 2.5 billion mobiles in use today, probably 3 billion by the end of this decade, which is a dramatic increase over the number of telephone terminations that had been present uh, even only five years ago. The reason that's significant is that many of these devices are internet enabled. And so many people in the world will first be introduced to the internet by way of a mobile rather than a laptop or a desktop. That's important for any company, including Google, that's interested in presenting services to people who are on the internet because they may have to do so through the uh, uh, narrow channel of a mobile device. This is a distribution of the population of internet users around the world roughly by region. And you'll notice that Asia is the absolute largest population of internet users already today. Ten years ago, it would have been the United States and North America. Today, 436.8 million users in Asia. Not surprising, considering that includes, uh, uh, includes India uh, and China, two of the most populous countries in the world. Uh, it's also predictable that with a penetration of only 11%, that this number can only get bigger and bigger over time. The implication will be that the content of the network will contain an increasing amount of material in Chinese and the 22 Indian languages. Uh, the cultures of those countries will be increasingly important on the internet. Their style of interaction, their interests, uh, will become quite, uh, if not dominant, at least a very, very uh, significant part of the network's fabric. Europe is the next largest region. Of course, Europe keeps uh, confusing us by adding new countries, so the definition of Europe keeps changing. Uh, or some of the countries split into multiple pieces. There, Yugoslavia, of course, disintegrated, and now there are even more uh, changes uh, apparently coming. Uh, Kosovo may be another uh, split off. Uh, so uh, Europe's numbers keep getting bigger by uh, adding new countries. But they're the second largest region uh, in the internet. The third one now is uh, North America. And since the populations of North America and, and Canada are not really getting much bigger rapidly, uh, it will uh, continue to be in the, major in the minority. And in fact, Latin America may ultimately exceed the North American population on the internet as well. You can certainly tell by looking at the penetration statistics, which you see on the right-hand column, uh, that uh, North America and uh, Oceania, the, the uh, islands of the, uh, of the Pacific, are, have the largest absolute percentage penetration. But as the others reach similar penetration rates, their absolute numbers will be dramatically bigger. I thought you might find it amusing to see where all this started. 
The predecessor to the internet was called the ARPANET. ARPA stood for the Advanced Research Projects Agency, part of the United States Defense Department, which was created in 1958, February of 1958, after the uh, Russian Sputnik was launched, October 4, 1957. The 50th anniversary of that, by the way, is about to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I happened to be fortunate enough to be a graduate student at UCLA writing the software on the Sigma 7 computer that you see in the lower right, uh, which was the first computer to be attached to the packet-switched ARPANET. This is the first network to use packet switching in a wide area. The idea was to demonstrate that that particular style of computer communication was in fact feasible for interactive work and for file transfers and the like. Well, the Sigma 7 is in a computer museum now, and I, some people probably think I should be there along with it. But the fact is that uh, this was where it started with four computers uh, in December of 1969. There were some important milestones along the way, but this one is particularly significant, and we are coming up on its 30th anniversary in November. There were three packet switch networks that were integrated to form the Internet. The first one was the ARPANET. You saw how it began, with four small nodes expanding to uh, about 50 or so, maybe even more, uh, over time. This was a Defense Department project, and the question was, can we use computers to implement command and control? And in order to do that in a credible way, the computers would have to be available to ships at sea. They would have to be available to mobile mechanized uh, infantry. Uh, on, the, on the surface, land, uh, land mobile uh, systems. And so we actually built a packetized mobile radio network and, and uh, put it into operation in the San Francisco Bay Area and then later tested it with the military in uh, North Carolina. And we built a packet satellite network to emulate ships at sea communicating with each other and ship to shore. So it was those three networks with very different speeds, very different packet sizes, very different characteristics as to packet loss that uh, drove the design of the Internet. And on November 22nd, 1977, for the first time, we got all three of these networks to interwork directly with each other. And it was an important ste step, I think, in the evolution of the net because it was the first time we'd gotten three different networks to work smoothly together. You could do almost anything to get two networks to interact by putting a gateway in between and doing all kinds of odd uh, things. But to get three of them to work this way in, in such a fashion that the computers on each of those nets had no idea how the packets were being transferred through the system uh, was an important accomplishment. This was also uh, rather interesting from the purely statistical point of view. We had a mobile packet radio van driving up and down the San Francisco Bayshore Freeway, sending packets through the packet radio net to a gateway linking that mobile radio network to the ARPANET, the wireline ARPANET. The traffic went all the way across the United States to an internal satellite link inside the ARPANET that took it, the traffic all the way to Norway and down to University College London. It then exited from the ARPANET through another gateway into the Atlantic Packet Satellite Network, went back up over another satellite channel down to uh, ETAM, West Virginia, and then back into the ARPANET again, all the way across the United States and down to University uh, of uh, Southern California Information Sciences Institute in Marina del Rey, California. Now, why do I go to all the detail? Well, if you follow as the bird flies from San Francisco to Los Angeles, about a 400-mile trip. If you follow the packet flow, it's an 88,000-mile trip because it went up and down through two different satellites twice. So the, uh, the packets actually made it, which I remember being pretty surprised at. Uh, and so it's like all software people, we were leaping up and down saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. So it was an important milestone, and we're going to celebrate that 30th anniversary next month at SRI International. Well, if you fast forward another 22 years, you see the Internet uh, in 1999, and it looks sort of like this now. All you can tell from these kinds of pictures, these are sort of topological connectivity pictures, is it got bigger, it got more complex, and it got more colorful. And that's as good a description of today's Internet as anything else I could offer you today. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about the way technology is shaping the network. Uh, you can tell that uh, I had a t-shirt made that says, IP on everything. <laughs> and it actually was intended to illustrate a very deliberate design decision that Bob Kahn and I made in 1973 when we started working on this thing. We knew at the time that we did not know what new switching and transmission technologies would be invented but we wanted the internet and its packets to flow over any of those transmission and switching technologies. And so it was an attempt to future-proof it, so we wanted to make sure that internet packets could flow on what later turned into optical fibers, satellite networks, asynchronous transfer mode systems, frame relay, X25, and all the other new kinds of switching techniques, you know, MPLS, optic, you know, uh, oh, anyway, it, so you get the point. I had this t-shirt made and then I realized as time went on and as the internet protocol became more widely standardized and available that I needed a new t-shirt. I think it should say IP under everything because what happens is people assume that the network is there and they're building all of these new applications and new protocols on top of it in the expectation that it is available. Something else which I didn't fully appreciate at the time but I feel much more aware of now is that these internet packets, in addition to not caring how they were carried, also didn't know or care what they were carrying. All these packets know is that they have a bag of bits to move from point A to point B through the network, and they don't have any idea how those bits are being interpreted. The only thing that knows what the bits mean is the computer receiving them on the edge of the network. And this led to a formulation called the end-to-end -end principle, which said that it doesn't matter whether you're carrying audio or video or a piece of email or part of a web page, it only matters that the bits get from where they started to where they need to go at the uh, end of the internet or the edge of the internet. So that end-to-end -end principle has been a fundamental element in the innovation of the internet today. People have been able to invent new applications and bring them up on the net without having to get permission from an ISP or any other authority to try these new ideas out. Uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page didn't have to get permission from an internet service provider to try out their ideas for Google uh, searching and, uh, of the internet. Nor did the people at Yahoo, nor the people at eBay, nor at Amazon, nor at Skype or any of the other very visible uh, application service providers, it's really important to maintain this openness, this neutrality, this, this ability to uh, ignore the applications that are being implemented on the network. Uh, it's almost like uh, building a road system and saying as long as you stay within certain limits, the cars are not longer or wider or taller than certain amounts and not heavier than a certain amount, then any vehicle meeting those characteristics could be placed on the road. Uh, and uh, is essentially not even specifying anything about what buildings are adjacent to the roads, whether it's a gas station or a shopping mall or a residential uh, facility. So if you use that analogy, the internet is just a road system with some rules associated with being on the road. All of the creativity and innovation that you see today is the result of people being able to try new ideas out uh, without any particular constraints. So radio is providing the ability to work in mobile mode on the network. For high-speed fiber or cable or DSL, digital subscriber loops are providing some significant capacity. Um, broadband in the United States, however, is impaired. This is a big issue for me. It's not symmetric. The residential broadband services usually allow you to, to download a lot more than you can uh, upload. And that leads to anomalies. You may be able to receive high quality video in a conference call, but you can't generate it. And so the result is the two parties don't get the kind of uh, high quality service that they would get if they were business customers getting symmetric capacity. Uh, although I must say, President Durden, you have a very uh, uh, lovely arrangement, 100 megabit per second service at the house. And that's, uh, I've been arguing with Verizon over a 45 megabit per second service, but they want $2,200 a month for it, and I haven't been prepared to pay for that. So uh, uh, I, if you don't mind, I'll hang around a little longer. <laughs> um, 
So this is an area, I think, of importance uh, to us in the U.S. to get broadband facilities that are less expensive and more symmetric than they are today. And finally, uh, we're facing a very critical problem, uh, which is my fault. Uh, the uh, maximum size address space in the Internet is constrained by the 32-bit addresses, uh, which are part of the packet format. Those 32-bit addresses allow for up to 4.3 billion unique addresses in the Internet. And that's my fault, because uh, during 1976, the engineers uh, argued for over a year over how large should the address space be for this experimental network. Some wanted 32 bits, some wanted 128 bits, and some wanted variable length. Well, the variable length guys were thrown out pretty quickly by the programmers who said it's a pain in the neck to deal with variable length stuff. And so we were left with either 32 or 128 bits. And at the time, I was in the uh, Defense Department trying to get this project to move ahead. Nobody was coming to any reasonable conclusion. So I said, it's 32 bits, that's it, we're done, let's get going. I figured 4.3 billion was more than enough addresses for an experiment. And I thought when we finished the experiment, demonstrated that the technology made sense, that we would then do a production version. Well, we never got to do the production version because it just kept getting bigger and bigger and finally became a commercial enterprise. Now it's a global system. We're going to run out of IP version 4, 32-bit address space, somewhere around 2011. So a new address space has been de designed and standardized as far back as 1996. It's called IP version 6. And if you're counting and wondered what happened to IP version 5, it was an experiment in um, streaming uh, video and audio that didn't work out very well, so we canceled it and just picked the next number. So IPv6 has 128 bits of address space. That's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. I used to run around saying that's enough address space so every electron in the universe can have its own web page if it wants to. <laughs> and then I got an email from somebody at Caltech, dear Dr. Surf, you jerk. There's 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and you're off by 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. <laughs> but it is 340 trillion 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 addresses, which should be enough to last until after I'm dead, and then it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> so we need to move to IP version 6. And although this, uh, this lecture tonight is not intended to dive very deeply into the details of that, tomorrow when I have a chance to talk to some of the computer science crew, I am going to talk about the difficulties of getting v6 into operation. Let me, let me shift now to a somewhat different perspective of the Internet. How, what are we seeing emerging out of this global system? And one of the things which is frankly unexpected is that the information consumers, these are consumers of traditional broadband uh, mass media, are becoming producers of content. In the traditional mass medium, a small number of producers generate large amounts of content for a large number of recipients who don't have the ability to respond. But with blogging and video uploads like YouTube or Google Video and personal web pages and the like, we've made it possible for those receivers of information to also produce substantial quantities of information. That is a major change from the historical models of mass media. The second thing is that innovation is occurring at the edges of the network. This isn't to say there is no innovation inside the network. There's been tremendous change in the implementations of the Internet protocols, but the basic protocols have remained the same over quite a long period of time. But it's at the edges of the net where the new ideas come. And to give you an example of how low the barriers to innovation have uh, become. Think about Wikipedia for a moment. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this. Imagine that you're looking at a paragraph from the Wikipedia and you see a single word in the paragraph that is wrong and you know it's wrong because you're the expert and you change that word because the Wikipedia allows you to do that. That is an important contribution. The one word change is an important contribution because it shares uh, important knowledge with anyone who happens to look at that one paragraph. You'd never publish a one page book. You would not publish a one, I'm sorry, one word book. You wouldn't publish a one word uh, uh, scholarly paper. But you can publish that one word in Wikipedia and it makes a difference. So the barrier to making these contributions is essentially zero because you can put in one word, one page, uh, a book, a movie, 
any kind of digitizable medium is fair game in this internet environment. Another thing which is clearly emerging, and I think many of the students here are contributing to this, are the uh, social networking spaces, whether it's uh, Facebook or MySpace or Orchid or some of the others. They're very, very popular mechanisms for allowing people to establish social networks uh, augmented by and aided by computer exchanges. Uh, game playing has turned out to be extremely popular. Now, multi-user games have been around for a very long time, more than 25 years. Uh, but they are more elaborate now than they ever were. And I don't know how many of you have Second Life characters. Um, I have one, but I haven't done much with it. Uh, World of Warcraft is another extraordinarily elaborate multi-user game. Uh, in fact, some of these things are so uh, complex that economists are beginning to ask their students to study and observe people's behavior in these uh, artificial uh, virtual environments because there are sometimes interesting economic experiments going on with different kinds of rules of, uh, of exchange taking place. There are even people making money out of the virtual games, not the ones who are offering the games, but people who will offer, for example, to produce a better looking avatar than the one you currently have. Maybe better hairdo, maybe nicer clothes, and they get paid for doing that. So there are these spin-off uh, uh, revenue opportunities that the game systems have permitted. In fact, in general, there are many new business models that are being explored in this internet-enabled environment. Uh, when you look at eBay, this is the creation of an auctioning system that could not exist in the real world. You could not bring together the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people that use that system in any one room, but you can bring them together virtually through the internet and create a market that couldn't exist any other way. Uh, if you look at the economics of digital information, you are immediately compelled by how it changes old business models. To give you an example, uh, about a year ago, I purchased a terabyte of disk storage for use at home for about $1,000. Now, before somebody leaps up and says, I got mine for $200, I know that I went to the wrong store, the prices have gotten lower. But I do remember buying $1,000 worth of disk storage in 1979. It was the size of a shoebox, and it held 10 megabytes of memory. So today I can buy a terabyte of memory in a smaller size than that 10 megabytes was for substantially less money. And I wondered, well, what would it have cost me to buy a terabyte of memory in 1979? If you do the arithmetic, the answer is $100 million. Now, I can tell you I didn't have $100 million in 1979. Uh, and to be honest, I still don't have $100 million. Uh, but I can also tell you that if I had had $100 million in 1979, my wife wouldn't let me spend it on disk memory. It would have been some more significant transaction than that, I'm sure. Uh, the point here is that the cost of digital storage, transmission, and switching has dropped dramatically. And it gets to the point now where there are applications that you do on the net that you could never do in the real world. Imagine trying to sell or set up a, a warehouse to sell CDs and DVDs with a million titles. Think about the square footage you'd need to have to store this material, the cost of reproducing all the material in physical medium, and the fact that you'd have to replicate these warehouses in order to attract a certain market because people are not going to drive 500 miles to get to your store. Whereas on the internet you can put up a server with all of that content on it for not very much money and then deliver the things as needed through the network at much, much lower cost. So you create a market for that content which you can meet with very, very different economics than you can with traditional kinds of media. So these kinds of changes, these economic changes are so dramatic that they force some companies built around older business models to either reinvent themselves or they go out of business. I mean, Darwin was right. Either adapt or die. Those are the only choices that you have. So internet economics is really uh, challenging a great many traditional industries. Uh, it's also interesting that the internet is, because it's so insensitive to the media that it's carrying, it doesn't matter whether it's video or audio or anything else as long as it's digitizable. And finally, there is a group interaction capability in the internet that doesn't exist in the older media. 
you do telephone calls mostly one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, we have conference calling, and it's a very popular application, but the bulk of the calls are one-on-one. -on -one. Most of the other mass media are small numbers of producers, large numbers of receivers, and no group interaction at all, no ability to respond to uh, the originators, whereas in the Internet, groups of interaction are very, very common. So these are all very different, very new kinds of social and economic effects. This is just a, a chart, uh, and in the, uh, I don't know whether you can see, it says YouTube there. This, um, that, uh, this color right here uh, illustrates the relative percentage of YouTube video that's being carried on the Internet. Probably this was uh, about, uh, probably earlier this year, it's in July. Uh, the idea here is just to point out how quickly some of the new applications consume capacity in the Internet. It's another example of how hard it is to predict how much and what kind of capacity is going to be demanded in the Internet because some of these new applications become extremely popular very, very quickly. So I'd like to make a point here, and this is a, a little bit of a busy slide, but let me try to explain where, we're, where I'm going with this. The common view of Internet television, IPTV, that you hear from mostly the telephone companies is a streaming video model which frankly tries to turn the television, I'm sorry, tries to turn the internet into a cable television system. I submit to you that the internet is a much, much richer environment than simple television channels. But it depends on two crucial parameters. One of them is the data rate that you can sustain at the edges of the net. And the other one is the amount of storage that you have available uh, in, uh, in your computer locally. Uh, I've already talked about how cheap it is to have large amounts of storage, so this is not a big barrier to overcome anymore. But let's try to analyze the kinds of ways in which video content can be delivered and used in the Internet. If you have very low data rates, too low to deliver uh, full motion video, and if you have no ability to record anything, then basically nothing works. That's the lower left-hand corner of this picture. If, on the other hand, you have extremely high transmission capacity, high enough to deliver video in real time, or even faster than real time, then uh, you can uh, deliver a, a real-time video signal in, in the streaming form in, in the same way that you do over a cable system. Uh, the this, this notation RT and PR means real-time and pre-recorded. Uh, if you have a pre-recorded uh, video, you can deliver it in real time over a high enough speed circuit access to the Internet. If you have very low storage, however, you can't store it for very long. You have not enough to store, uh, you know, 10 minutes or an hour or two hours of, of video. So the only thing you can do with a high speed access to the Internet and no local storage is just watch the video as it comes. But now let's look at the other side of this picture where there's a high degree of storage available. Now the options get very rich. At low transmission speeds, too low to deliver video in real time, you can still deliver it. It kind of trickles in. You store it locally, and then you play it back in real time. And so if you have a real-time video stream, you can't watch it in real time because the data rate's too low, but you can store it and play it back later, similarly with a pre-recorded uh, piece of video. That's if the transmission rates are low but the storage is high. If on the other hand you have very high transmission rates and high storage capability, you have some really interesting possibilities here. Clearly, uh, because of the high speeds, you can watch a real-time stream in real time. You can take the real-time stream and you can record it, which is what you do with TiVo and uh, other personal video recorders. If you have a pre-recorded stream, you can still play it in real time. But here's where things get really interesting. If you have very high transmission speeds and you have pre-recorded material, you can deliver it faster than real time. This is what you do today with the iPods. You typically download music faster than you would listen to it and play it back whenever you want to. What the telcos are missing, I think, in their analysis of the possibilities of video on the Internet 
is the idea that you could deliver video faster than real time for material which is pre-recorded. You can't deliver real time television faster than real time because it's being produced in real time. Whether it's a you know, real time sports event or an emergency or a newscast. But the idea that you could deliver things faster than real time is very interesting and very different from streaming. If you have a gigabit per second access to the net, which by the way you can get in Japan for 8,700 yen a month, it's about $100, uh, you can download a couple of hours worth of video in 30 seconds. So the notion of video on demand is not simply streaming video, it's downloading things and playing them back. And I'm going to come back to that particular scenario to illustrate some business opportunities that this alternative uh, generates. First of all, if you're downloading streams of packets, they don't have to be confined to audio and video in this television environment. In fact, let me suggest to you that the term television should be reserved for today's industry with its business models and everything else. And the term video should be reserved for the medium video because video on the internet is not the same as television because the business models don't have to be the same. So let's think about this for a minute. I can download packets and I don't care what they have in them so they could have audio and video but they could have text they could have books they could have other digitized information programs could be anything so imagine you're downloading a movie not only are you getting the video and the audio of the movie but you're getting information about when it was made and who made it and what was the book it was based on something about the author and by the way you could download advertising information now this gets to be rather interesting because when you play this thing back, you're sucking packets off the disk, you have a programmable device which is interpreting the packets. It's not a dumb raster scan thing. It's actually looking at the data, deciding what to do with it. If some of that information is advertising information, you don't have to confine yourself to the old television advertising model, which is interrupt the program just at the most crucial part and make sure they hang around watching the commercial before you, you get back to the who, you know, who shot John. So instead, you can use the model that Google has so successfully monetized, allowing the customer to be in total control of what advertisements they watch or if they watch them at all. So imagine you downloaded information about some of the things that you see in the movie. You've heard of the term product placement where people pay money to put the Macintosh uh, with the logo prominently in the middle of the screen or the car comes driving up and you see the grill of the Cadillac. Those are all attempts to monetize product placement. But now imagine that you, you have a movie playing. It's being played through your laptop or through a, a computer controlled device and you can mouse around on the screen and click on things in the field of view if the information that was downloaded about that product has sort of activated that object in the field of view a window can pop up and tell you something about that product and if you happen to be online at the time that you're clicking on that object you can actually reach out into the internet and pull back real time fresh information about the product, who buys it, where is it available, uh, what are the competitive prices, and so on. Suddenly the consumer is in charge of the advertising experience, not the advertiser, and not the party delivering the content. This is such a, di a, a diversion away from the classical business model that it's very, very hard for some companies to completely understand that they could exercise very, very different uh, mechanisms in order to monetize the entertainment. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand that this is a Google plan to do something. It's not. These are, these are just observations about how this alternative way of treating video uh, could be quite different from the user point of view. Um, I think the other thing which is rather interesting uh, is that uh, if you have streams of packets that are coming in, they could be uh, destined for different devices if they're internet enabled. So if you have multiple televisions in the house, there's nothing stopping you from aiming one stream of packets with one particular video at it and another stream of packets with a different video on it and the two just naturally get routed 
uh, from you know, the receiver to the appropriate destination devices. So you don't have to worry about having a wire going down to the, some central server in the house. It's just a packet stream that gets switched. I've already seen some traditional cable companies having uh, video being shown and they're running a little uh, streaming um, uh, bar at the bottom with people's comments about the movie as they're watching it. So you're actually sitting on the World Wide Web running a chat room. The chat comments are running at the bottom of the screen. So it's a mingling together of the internet-based technologies and, uh, and the uh, traditional television technologies. So I see some remarkable uh, potential here for changing the way in which people use uh, the internet uh, and television. Now if I can get the attention of this thing, there we are. I had mentioned earlier that mobiles are a very significant part of, uh, of uh, the internet's face to the public. Uh, two and a half billion and counting. I carry a Blackberry, probably many of you have similar kinds of things. They're a big challenge in some sense because they have a display that's the size of a 1928 television set. Uh, they have varying data rates uh, that might be uh, uh, 19 kilobits up to maybe a, a megabit per second and they have a keyboard that's suitable for people that are three inches tall. So uh, it's a challenge to fit some of your applications into this thing. But they're programmable devices. And the consequence of that is that you can use them as control devices. They're not just telephones. You can put almost any application you can figure out how to program into these things. Some people, uh, especially in the developing world, don't have checking accounts. Uh, they don't have uh, easy access to cash, but they often have mobiles. They're using minutes in the mobile system to move money back and forth between accounts as a means of payment because the minutes are worth something, they have value. And so you're seeing microeconomies starting to grow up in the developing world using mobiles as the medium of exchange or transferring minutes back and forth. Uh, you could use these, uh, these systems in, in navigational uh, situations, especially if they have GPS receivers in them, or even if they don't, if you have access to GPS information, then you can use the mobile as an information appliance that you carry around with you. It means you have an opportunity to find out information that you need that has to do with your locale. Uh, Sigrid and I took a, a vacation trip uh, in May this year. We went off to uh, a uh, uh, Lake uh, Powell near uh, Page, Arizona. And in the course of planning the trip, we planned to rent a houseboat, and we wanted to make some nice meals while we were out on the houseboat. And we knew that once we got on the lake, we weren't going to have access to gourmet uh, foods and wines and things like that. So while we're driving around in Arizona, uh, I'm starting to uh, I get a nice uh, edge signal on my BlackBerry. And I'm asking questions like, can we buy any fancy wines in Williams, Arizona? And so I trust Google. Uh, ask uh, where can I get wine, you know, fine wine in, in uh, Williams, Arizona. And what comes back is one source, the wine loft. And the, uh, I got a little map that came up, so we drove over there, it was up on the second floor, and we bought about $400 worth of really good wine. And then we drove to Page, Arizona, and as we're driving into Page, we're thinking, what kind of food are we going to make? And we thought, well, how about paella? And I thought, well, if we're going to do that, we need saffron. Where the hell do you get saffron in Page, Arizona? Back to Google. You know, saffron grocery store, Page, Arizona, and what pops up is a little Safeway store with the map to get there and a telephone number. So again, because it's a Blackberry, I clicked on the phone number, made a call, and uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, when somebody answered, I said, could I speak to the spice department, please? Now, this is a small store, and it's probably the owner I'm talking to. This is the spice department. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, well, do you have any saffron? He said, just a moment, I'll check. And he came back on the phone and says, yep. And so I followed the map to get there. This is all happening in real time. We dash into the store and buy $12.99 worth of saffron, which is 0 0.06 ounces, in case you wondered. Uh, and it worked out very well. We made a nice paella and had some nice wines. But I, I came away from that experience with a visceral understanding of the value of an information appliance on your hip which got you information that was relevant to the location you were in. And so I come away with a much more uh, intense feeling of the value of geographically indexed information. More and more of that is becoming available and becoming monetized, and that's an important 
concept in this uh, mobile world. Uh, Google is, is finding huge interest in geographically indexed information. Google Earth and Google Maps are used uh, very, very often for a variety of, of reasons. People wanting to present information that they know about what's going on in given locations or what has happened in that location or what is going to happen in that location. You know, where are my friends? Or if you're a scientist and you have a, uh, uh, a sensor system, you use Google Earth or Google Maps to show where the sensors are and when you click on the icons, they open up to say uh, what's going on at that particular sensor. So it's become an extremely valuable tool for what we call mashups, which are linking together different applications and content using standard publicly available application programming interfaces. So let me move on to a prediction that I'd like to make. I believe that there are going to be many billions of devices on the internet. Uh, and in particular, there are devices that I never in my wildest dreams thought would be part of the internet environment, like refrigerators or picture frames uh, or telephones that look like telephones, but they're really voice over IP computers. But this guy in the middle is the one that really amazed me. It's an internet enabled surfboard. This guy was in San Diego, and I assume he must have been sitting out there waiting for the next big wave, thinking, you know, if I had a computer in my laptop, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave on this surfboard. So he built a laptop into his surfboard and put a Wi-Fi service back on the rescue shack on the beach, and now he sells this as a product. So in case you're interested in an internet-enabled surfboard, you have a place to get it. Uh, and, you know, and it makes a certain amount of sense. So uh, my prediction is there will be literally billions of devices on the internet. Um, we already see a lot of them. You go into a hotel room, you see a web TV and a, and a wireless infrared keyboard. Personal digital assistants like the BlackBerry and others are already on the net. Uh, video games are very popular on the internet. They allow people to talk to each other while they're playing the video games and the like. The picture frame uh, is a very popular device. People upload digital images off of a website into the picture frame on a regular basis. And of course, you, you, I'm sorry, they download from the website and you upload from a digital camera uh, into the uh, website, which then downloads the images into the picture frames. And so this is kind of nice for the grandparents. You know, they put these picture frames up in the living room. They don't have to boot up Windows or log in or anything. It just every 24 hours it wakes up and says, what new pictures should I be? downloading and displaying. Of course, um, you, those of you who are interested in security will appreciate that if a hacker gets to the website that the picture frame is downloading from, the grandparents may see pictures that they hope are not of the grandchildren. Uh, so, uh, you know, the security in the, uh, at home is just as important as security at work. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other speculative uh, possibilities of using internet-enabled devices, and I know I'm running late here, so I don't want to uh, go too far over any further, but so I can't talk about all of these things, but uh, let, me pick, um, let me pick one because I know that there are some physicists in the crowd. Uh, you'll know that um, there is no Nobel Prize for computer science because that's considered a branch of mathematics and there really isn't any Nobel Prize for mathematics either. So I got to thinking how sad that was and I thought, well, is there something I could do? And uh, one thought was uh, to adapt an idea behind Schrodinger's um, theory about the, the ability of a fundamental particle to be in more than one state at the same time. You'll remember that he described an experiment, a thought experiment, in which a cat was put inside of a box together with a capsule of uh, cyanide, and inside the capsule of cyanide was a, a bit of radium, and the theory was that if the radium emitted a particle, an alpha particle, it would shatter the capsule and the cat would inhale the um, uh, the cyanide and die, but you seal it. By the way, no cats were hurt. This is a, uh, a Gedanken experiment. Uh, so if you seal this system up in a box and you ask what's the state of the cat, the answer is you don't know until you open up the box to look inside. So you have to treat the system as if the cat's simultaneously alive and dead. So I suggest that there is a macro quantum particle called a bottle of wine. And uh, it behaves exactly like this because you don't know what condition it's in. It could be absolutely awful or it could be absolutely spectacular or every value in between. And until you open up the bottle, it has to be treated as if it has all those values at the same time. So I'm hoping to submit this to the Nobel Prize Committee and, uh, and, and <laughs> attract their attention to an important new theory of macro quantum uh, characteristics. Um, and if somebody wants to know a bit uh, internet enabled socks, we can get to that in the Q&A. Uh, let me... Uh, let me just mention that there are a wide range of challenges that the digital 
information age poses. One of them is intellectual property protection because intellectual property rules have been built around the physical copying of objects, whether it's a record or a CD or a book. These are physical uh, copies of things and the laws are saying you can't make copies without permission. The problem is that digital material is so easy to duplicate and so easy to transmit and uh, you know you, when you don't use it up when you make a copy of it the other you know, the original piece is still there and so this is challenging our notions of copyright and asking should we change the way those rules work in this digital age and I don't have a good answer to that except to say it's a hard problem uh, the other thing that really worries me is that as we move into this age in which software is intimately associated with the presentation of information, that we are reaching the point now where there are things that you can construct that you cannot view without the aid of a computer. That There may be no simple printed rendition of these objects or no, no uh, textual rep or even image uh, representation. The consequence of that is that these are pieces of information that have to be preserved in digital form in order to be understood and need software to interpret them. And this leads to my big worry about what I will call bit rot. Imagine for a moment it's the year 3000. You've just done a Google search and you picked up a 1997 PowerPoint file. Let's pretend that you're running Windows 3000. And the question is, will Windows 3000 know how to interpret a 1997 PowerPoint file? And the answer is probably no. This is not a dig at Microsoft at all. Over a thousand year period, the likelihood that any piece of software would be, you know, maintain backward compatibility is pretty low, even in the presence of uh, open source software. So it becomes a very serious question, how do I preserve my ability to interpret bits that I've stored away in an online system? Well, one answer is I need to preserve the program that produced and knows how to interpret the bits. I might even need to preserve the operating system that ran the program that knows how to interpret the bits. I might even need to preserve the hardware or an interpreter of it that ran the operating system that ran the application that knows how to interpret the bits. But there are intellectual property issues hidden in that sequence. Do I have access to the operating systems? Do I have access to the instruction set of the computer? let alone access to the application package. I need to find, or we collectively need to find a way to deal with that problem, and the library science world right now is challenged to deal with these digital objects that over time are going to be more and more difficult to interpret, and if we don't find a, pro a solution to the problem, we're going to end up with an internet that is filled with uninterpretable digital data. And that's not going to be the outcome that everybody wants. I want, I want information to be as accessible in the year 3000 as it is or was in 1997. We did it and have done it with vellum manuscripts, which you can still read today. They're a thousand years old. We can't afford to mess this up because we moved into the digital uh, era. So let me finish uh, by giving you a quick update on where we are in the interplanetary internet. Now, we in this case is not Google, so I don't want you to run out of the auditorium saying, aha, I figured out Google's business model that's gonna take over the solar system. This is a project that I started with my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in 1998. Now, you know, we've instrumented planet Earth and we're you know, being very observant now because of global warming and everything else. But a lot of our solar system exploration has been focused on Mars and some of the outer and inner planets. Uh, we've been communicating with spacecraft that are either in orbit around the planets or flying past the asteroids or even in some cases landing on the surface like the rovers that are on Mars today. The question is, what can we do to standardize the communication systems used in space exploration to get the same advantages out of that as we get out of today's internet. When you plug your laptop or your desktop into the internet, you can talk to 500 million other servers because of the standards. So we wanted to have a similar characteristic for space-based exploration, in part out of a belief that if we standardize the protocols, then a particular new uh, application, a new, a new mission, 
which has these standards in it, whatever they are, could make use of previous mission assets if they're still available because it would make them compatible in the same way that TCP IP does that for the internet. So we immediately went off to figure out whether we could use the standard internet design for interplanetary communication and, and this lasted about a week and then we realized that we had a couple of problems. Um, the first problem we had is that the distance between the planets is literally astronomical. And the, you know, the, the speed of light delay between Earth and Mars, depending on where we are in our respective orbits, orbits ranges from five minutes to 20 minutes one way. And of course, double that for round trip. The internet protocols were not designed with 40 minute round trips in, time, in, in mind. And of course, it gets worse as you get to some of the outer planets, it's hours. And so that was the first problem. Uh, the second problem uh, is that there is a very disruptive uh, environment in space because the, uh, the bodies in space are often in celestial motion, not only are they in orbit, but they're often rotating. So when you're trying to talk to something on the surface of Mars, Earth and Mars are both rotating and eventually they fall out of, out of view and you can't talk to them until the planet uh, uh, rotates back around again. And so we have both disruption and delay, intolerable disruption and delay, at least as far as the standard internet protocols are concerned. So we had to invent a whole new suite of protocols, which we've now done. We've been through four iterations of that. Uh, we're going to use standard internet on the surface of the planets and in the spacecraft because that's low delay, low latency environments, and we can uh, make that work very well. But we have to move into an interplanetary regime for the uh, plant interplanetary communications. Uh, without going into a lot of details about the way the protocols work, they behave a bit like email because in an email system, when you send an email, you don't know whether the person you're communicating with is online or not, you don't care. Because the email moves along from one MTA to another and is held until the party says, hello, I'm back online, please give me my email. Uh, so we have the new set of protocols, we call them delay and disruption tolerant protocols, or DTN for short. Uh, we are now testing these protocols terrestrially because we discovered that there were terrestrial applications that this interplanetary system could satisfy that we hadn't thought of while we were doing the original design. We went to the uh, Defense Department to DARPA, which had funded the ARPANET and Internet and also the original interplanetary architecture, and we said that um, we thought that the military was going to have a serious problem with tactical mobile communication because it's frequently disrupted. It could be jammed, you could be hiding in radio shadow to avoid getting shot at. There are all kinds of things that disrupt radio communication. Uh, so we suggested we should use DTN for that. And they agreed and we did some tests with the Marine Corps uh, over the past year. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, we, we provided them with DTN implementations in these little, uh, small little Linux based boxes. Uh, and then we said, what applications do you want to run? And they said, chat. And I remember thinking, are you, kid are you kidding? You know, you're sitting here chatting while bullets are flying around? And the answer is that the chat application has the advantage that if you miss something, it knows you missed it. And when you're back online again, it delivers everything that you missed. And so it's actually a good thing for synchronizing situation reports and communication with uh, your local colleagues. So um, that worked out so well that uh, after the experiment was over, they took all the equipment to Iraq. And I said, wait, it's an experiment. And they said, no, it isn't. And off they went. <laughs> so uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Then we were looking for a civilian application and somebody drew my attention to the reindeer herders in the northern part of Sweden, Norway, and Finland and Russia. They've been there for about 8,000 years, there are about 80,000 of them, and during the winter months they have very poor communication among the villages because satellite communication is very difficult. They're at 65 degrees north or more, the satellite antenna is right down on the horizon to talk to a synchronous satellite. So we said, okay, why don't we put DTN-enabled laptops in the snowmobiles and the backs of the four-wheel drives, and as they go from one village to another, we'll have a Wi-Fi hotspot in the villages, they'll pick up the, the email or any other things that need to be delivered and drop other things off using the DTN protocol. So we tried this out, uh, not this summer, but the summer last year in 2006, and it worked in that you know, one small experiment. So next year we're going to try a, a multi-village test of the DTN protocols for the reindeer herders. And if that works, uh, we uh, you know, expect to, uh, to be possibly commercialize that. And again, I don't mean Google here, but others who are interested in uh, serving that community. So in the long run, 
we are expecting to do some serious space testing of the interplanetary protocols. In 2009, we expect to have implementations on the space station. In 2011, we hope to use the, um, the deep impact spacecraft, which was used to penetrate a comet and see what was on uh, you know, the materials inside the comet. That spacecraft is still out there, and it's still functioning. It has power, it has computing capability, memory, and, and uh, radio communications. So we're going to upload the interplanetary network protocols, test it there, and then put the interplanetary protocols on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which just went into orbit last year in Mars. So what we're hoping by uh, the beginning of the next decade is to have a two-planet Internet in operation between Earth and Mars. And as new missions get launched, to the outer planets carrying these standard protocols, we hope to accrete a backbone of communication that can be used and reused by uh, subsequent missions that are either manned or robotic. So I don't want you to get the idea that we're trying to build an interplanetary backbone first and then hope somebody will come. That's not the theory. The theory is that we accrete this backbone mission by mission, which have been, each of those missions launched for scientific reasons, but providing an interplanetary backbone as a consequence. So that concludes my uh, formal remarks this evening. I'm very happy to uh, offer you uh, question and answers if you want them, and I do appreciate very much your attention. Thank you. Oh, we have people, uh, we have, you say we have students in the audience. Yes, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. There are students in the audience which will bring you a microphone uh, so that you can ask your questions. And theoretically, I'm live on this mic, is that right? The usual question is, can you hear me back there in the rear? And the answer is, no, we ain't built that way. <laughs> Sorry, okay. That's it. Okay, let's see, who do we have? We have... Two people here with microphones, and everybody wants to get out of the building. Yes, sir. Earlier, I mentioned the possibility of putting titles of all scientific articles on the internet. That would be extremely useful. And uh, you mentioned that you'd like to put the whole article on the internet. Well, that would be beyond belief, but is there a possibility of putting all titles on? I would, I would certainly think so. Uh, certainly, with, first of all, you can't copyright a title. Right. You may not know that, or you do, perhaps, and not everyone may know that. So uh, the answer is yes, it's possible to do that. Getting access to the material and, and capturing it. It could just be the contents page of the journals ought to be doable. Uh, personally, I would like to have all of the articles available and searchable so that people can do a, a good job of identifying content. That's why the Google uh, Book Search program is so important to us, because there's so much information which is uh, in printed form but not in machinable form now, lots and lots of it. We don't even need to be able to deliver the material online to be useful. Uh, your point is titles would be useful. My point about books online is that even, even if you can't deliver the content of the book, if you scan the book and you know what its, what its contents are, not, not the table of contents, but the actual words, full text, you can search the full text and tell someone there is a book that exists that matches your query. And even though we're not permitted to hand it to you online because it's still copyright, we can at least draw your attention to it. You might go to the library, go to the bookstore, or find somebody to borrow the book from, or may even be in your own library. You just didn't know that it had information in it that was significant to you. So uh, that's why I'm so eager to, uh, to get to the point where we can take materials that are not yet machine accessible and turn them into something that at least can be searched, if not necessarily fully delivered. So I hope we can do what you want and more. Other questions? Here's one over here. Oh, so she's going to, let's see. How, okay, so the way this works is the person with the microphone figures out who's going to ask the next question. So, uh, you know, <laughs> just wave. Thanks. 
Yes, sir. Uh, could the DTN technology be used in situations like the one laptop, laptop per child, where it's spread out over large areas? I'm sorry, this, it's, the acoustics in here are not working well sorry. for me. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, rather than having you shout, either I'm going to run up the stairs or you come down here so I can lip read okay. you. Okay. This, this, is the, this is the problem with being half deaf. That's not as bad as being half assed, I think. But <laughs> thank you for your uh, patience. And your question is. Okay, so the question is about something called one laptop per child and how do we get internet access to people who are spread out. Uh, Nick Negroponte from MIT has been the uh, author of that one laptop per child program. And I wanted to bring one with me and I, I messed up and I didn't, but it's a wonderful, beautiful little device. It looks like a thousand dollar laptop and it's only cost $175 to make. It's intended to be sold for $100. We have a little problem there with the economics, but uh, we'll get there with volume, maybe. In any case, uh, these are uh, internet-enabled devices. They have 802.11 radios in them, and they have software that allows the devices to form a mesh. So in a sense, this is a self-organizing network. And the people with the laptops, if they are within range of each other, can actually form a small network and then be interconnected. If any one of them is connected to the rest of the public internet, traffic will flow through. Uh, I don't mean to minimize the difficulty of A, handling a dynamic mesh where things are moving around, and B, dealing with flow and congestion control, but this isn't the right time to dive into the details. Uh, for me, uh, it's a very exciting possibility of bringing access to Internet's content to people who otherwise wouldn't get access to it. I have another project, personal project, in, in Nigeria, which is just about to get turned up. It's a, a solar-powered Internet cafe. And the idea is to bring Internet access by you know, a small VSAT uh, satellite antennas uh, in places where there isn't even any electricity by dropping in a solar-powered system and is serving anywhere from five to 25 uh, people uh, in, uh, in laptop-like stations. So once again, I think there are lots of opportunities for reaching those five billion people that don't have access today. Many of them may not, ever, may not start with the laptops, though. They may start with mobiles. But there's this, this spreading ability to get internet access is what is so exciting to me. And thank you for asking that. Are there other questions that uh, our microphone people have uh, discovered? Here's one. Sure. Now, we may end up asking you to come down if I can't hear you, but try it. That's oh, all right. Oh. <laughs> it's, not, yeah, it's not screaming that makes a difference. It's clarity. I'll keep That's it about two feet away. and we'll be a little better. Well, I have to ask this question. It's pretty basic. But you talked about, uh, you know, some of the new economies that have come online. And, and we're a uh, local Internet marketing company in the area here. And uh, I just yeah, had to ask one of the wizards. Uh, do you see, uh, you know, more business opportunities as, as companies, you know, as you know, Google becomes more geo-targeted or any other business ideas uh, that you foresee becoming a... Uh, uh, well, let's see. First of all, we, we generally don't comment at Google on any <laughs> plans that we haven't announced. So, I, and, and I don't have any special announcements to make tonight <laughs> about Google. Yeah, if you'd like to announce. However, uh, I think you could tell from, in fact, let me say that, that the, our motto, which says we want to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful, is taken very seriously by the management and the staff at Google, of which now there are 13,000 people, by the way. This is the fastest growing organization I've ever been connected with. I joined the company in October of 2005. There were 5,000 people. Now there are 13,000 people. But if you take that mantra, and you imagine all the kinds of information that there are in the world today, some of it online and some of it not. Imagine trying to make it accessible uh, through software, through computer programs, through the network, and invent in your own mind various kinds of applications. Uh, you can just about imagine the sorts of things that are going on. In fact, it's almost impossible to answer your question for the following reason, quite apart from Google's reluctance to talk about things it isn't ready to announce. There is a practice at Google that allows every engineer to take 20% of his or her time to do whatever they are interested in trying out. And so it's kind of like having a one day a week consulting opportunity. Do the math. 
about half of Google is engineering and computer science. That's 6,000 people, rough, roughly. One quarter, I'm sorry, 20% of their time, 1,500, uh, do I did that right? Yes, one-fifth one of 6,000, it's 1,200. 1,200 people, full-time in effect, are inventing and experimenting at Google. There's no way you could even begin to guess at what all the things are that they're trying out. And some things don't work. In fact, perhaps a lot of the experiments don't. But it doesn't matter that, that not all of them work out. Enough of them turn out to be interesting that it is a continuous stream of new products and services coming out of the company. And if you track the announcements, it's incredible. I, mean, I have trouble keeping straight anymore all the things that we have announced. Uh, so uh, I see Google continuing to evolve as a company. It has learned how to monetize the internet in ways that no one else has. And it's been very satisfying for the advertisers. They now know that when somebody clicks on an ad, they already know that the person is interested. That's a huge hurdle to get over. You can't tell that anybody looked at a page of a magazine, but you can tell that somebody clicked on an ad on the net. Looking at new ways of trying to monetize uh, advertising and print radio and television are other areas where we've shown some interest. So what you can anticipate from Google, I think, is a continuing stream of uh, new ideas trying to make information understandable to software. And this is probably where our biggest challenge lies because the semantics of what you're looking at is still very, very difficult to introduce into a computer context. Matching strings of text is pretty easy. But understanding that Jaguar is ambiguous and could mean the operating system at Apple, could mean the animal, or could mean the car. And knowing whether the search for Jaguar was intended at one of those three meanings, or knowing that the text of a particular web page that mentions Jaguar was referring to the car or the operating system uh, or the animal, knowing those two things and trying to match them up in order to produce meaningful useful results from a search, for example, it turns out to be hard. You know, pick the word red. Red means a color most of the time, but in some contexts it has, it has a political meaning to it. The question, which of those two was intended in the article that you're indexing and in the query that you're trying to serve? So these are areas, frankly, where I hope that computer science people will continue to chip away at, uh, at better representations. You can expect a lot of that to come out of Google and competitors. Okay. Other questions? Here's one. Hi. So uh, you said you have a Second Life character. Do you think that the Second Life sort of style, the like sort of virtual world style, will, will have a significant place in the future of like using the internet or even your computer? It, it really, that's a very interesting question. And I don't have an honest uh, answer that I, you know, sort of satisfied myself with. Uh, I have. I have to admit, the first time I you know, signed up my little character, and I'm standing here, and first of all, I was trying to figure out how to fly, and I didn't do very well. I was just hopping up and down like that. And then there was this rather uh, uh, attractive avatar that was in, in the neighborhood, so I just was staring at it, and it said to me, are you staring at me? And I said, well, yes. And, uh, and then she flew away. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, once a geek, always a geek, right? <laughs> so, uh, this, the social interactions are interesting, to say the least. Uh, and there are real people behind the avatars, which makes it somewhat more interesting than just a computer-generated uh, interaction. I'll tell you the place where I believe Second Life-like environments may turn out to be really interesting. Uh, imagine for just a moment that you have a number of scientific instruments that are actually online on the network, uh, an astronomical telescope or an electron microscope or uh, and, and, you know, other physical uh, measuring devices. Imagine that you have invented a virtual uh, laboratory in the Second Life environment and imagine that you're interacting with the virtual devices that are in that laboratory. Some of the interaction with the virtual devices might actually cause real-world things to happen. A picture taken from a real telescope and then transmitted to you in this virtual environment. You can imagine creating educational experiences for people 
who didn't necessarily have access to all of the instruments, real ones in the laboratory, but had access to some of them. Uh, so you create this emulated environment where they get to do some fairly rich experiments, even though some of them are not actually done in the real world. Uh, another possibility is that you carry out a transaction in the virtual environment and it causes a transaction to happen in the real world. The inverse of that is already happening. Uh, people buy and sell things in Linden dollars on eBay. And there was a big to-do on that question of whether you were allowed to get access to Linden dollars, which is part of Second Life, uh, simply because you happen to have real money. And we hear stories about people paying other people to play their characters for them in order to build up the character's experience and armor and whatever, you know, magic swords and so on. Uh, and some people say, well, that's cheating. And other people say, well, you know, that's the real world. Uh, so I think, I think the answer is that uh, we are going to see experiments in the virtual environments increasingly. Now, the thing that I still haven't fully uh, digested is um, these three-dimensional displays where you put goggles over your head and you have a 3D environment that you can move around in. And as you move around, the images change. Now, I got to thinking of what it would be like to have a video conference with someone uh, wearing one of these goggles. And it isn't exactly clear what you should be seeing. What does the other person look like? Does the other person look like somebody wearing goggles? You know, and you know, you're looking at each other wearing goggles, and that's sort of weird. So does that mean you have to create a virtual image of yourself so that you, even though you're wearing the goggles, the person on the other end sees your virtual image, which isn't wearing goggles? That, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I am persuaded that there is enough interest in these environments expressed by people who are willing to pay to participate in them. What EverQuest, one, several years ago, I was told that EverQuest had I don't know how many, several million uh, subscribers, $14.50 a month to play the game, and half a million people were online at any one time, and this is three or four years ago. So the fact is there's a business model that supports these environments. So that says they're potentially sustainable. I think they get more and more interesting as time goes on. Let me give you one other example of a virtual environment, which I find pretty exciting. There is a company in Palo Alto that calls itself Intuitive Surgical. They make a device called the Da Vinci uh, Surgical System. It interposes a software system between the surgeon and the patient. Now, anyone who writes software should right away be panicking about, boy, I sure don't want to be on the receiving end of that piece of software. This is pretty carefully uh, tested stuff because the FDA has to approve it. Uh, the surgeon sits looking in a, uh, a 3D display below which are manipulating instruments. The software is in between, and then there is a robot which has anywhere from three to four different arms. At least one of them is, the, uh, is a uh, device which contains a stereo video camera and some lights. And uh, the surgery is done in what's called minimally invasive mode. So you make small incisions, the two operating instruments go into those incisions, and then the uh, thing developing the, uh, or, or showing the visual uh, scene this is the third arm that goes in. Uh, and the surgeon is looking at this operating area in this in, in his 3D display. It turns out that you can now remote that to any number of consulting surgeons so that they could be across the network seeing what the surgeon is seeing. I wouldn't necessarily suggest that they should be actually doing the surgery because of the round trip time delay and the possibility of a network hiccup and you don't want, you don't want the oops, <laughs> uh, gee, I dropped a packet and that, uh, <clears throat> that, I wonder what that little yellow thing was that we just cut off. So uh, I think you don't want that to happen, but um, the ability to share the immediate information about the surgery to get consultations uh, is actually pretty exciting, can be used for educational purposes as well. So this sort of mix of the real and virtual, it seems to me, is uh, not w fully exploited yet. And I believe it's going to be a rich uh, area in which to explore. There's one other area which uh, I didn't think of until last week. There was a, um, a conference with some students in Japan, and it had to do with um, the use of robotics. Normally, uh, people think of robots as being autonomous. 
But we were thinking, what happens if you use them as a telepresence mechanism? Suppose that you have a, a robot with vision and hearing and manipulators that you can control directly through the network. Now, setting aside the problems of round trip time delay, which makes steering and walking difficult, uh, the idea that you might remotely interact with an environment through a robot uh, leaves you with some pretty interesting speculations about how people will react to the robot. It's, it's you, but it sure doesn't look like you. It's this thing, you know, with arms and whatnot. But we may actually end up projecting ourselves from our virtual space into the real world through these kinds of robotic extensions. Telepresence works in both directions, and for a number of space applications, it may turn out to make a lot of sense. You're inside a safe uh, environment, and you're manipulating the robots that are outside in the more dangerous conditions. So I actually believe that this, this whole virtual environment thing is going to be explored substantially further than it has already. I think this is the signal that says, last question, okay. Is there a last question? Here's one right here. Do you want to throw the microphone down? Or he want to ask the question. I have He's a question got the microphone. of my own. Uh, Go for it. You, you mentioned earlier that in Japan, one could purchase gigabit service for about $80 or so. Yeah. And uh, I've heard in general that broadband service in, in this country is uh, below that in Europe and other areas. And I wondered if you could share your thoughts on why that might be and how the situation could be improved. Uh, the short answer is that in most of the places in the world where you can get very high-speed internet service, the regulatory agencies have insisted that the broadband providers uh, supply high-speed services at uh, you know, reasonable prices um, and keep their systems openly accessible. So uh, in Stockholm, for example, the city has pulled fiber throughout all of the various conduit and uh, you know the the cisterns and or, uh, all the other uh, underground piping, um, and they sell access to the fiber for about a hundred euros a month. This is dark fiber, so you have to bring your own optical electro optical systems. But the result is that they don't have much operational responsibility. But anyone who wants to can bring up very very high speed networking. One of my engineer friends has a 40 gigabit per second access to his house in Stockholm because he got access to the fiber and put his own electronics on it. Uh, I could look, rattle off a bunch of other places like uh, Korea where you can get extremely high speed service or in Seoul, uh, I'm sorry, Seoul in Korea or Hong Kong or Singapore. And in almost all of those cases, uh, the regulatory agencies have insisted that the Monopoly telcos keep their systems open and accessible. Uh, the prices are remarkably low. It, it almost made me want to move to Kyoto when I heard about this uh, gigabit service in, in Japan. Um, in the US, we don't have the same kind of regulatory perspective that other parts of the world seem to have brought to this table. And there's an implicit belief uh, in today's FCC, I think, that by deregulating everything, that somehow that will produce uh, increased competition. I don't believe that that's happened. I think that we don't have uh, much choice uh, in residential broadband internet service, and I think a new posture is needed, but it might take a change of administration before we get there. I think if we hear from the uh, American user population, that they're completely dissatisfied with broadband internet access, that might get the attention of some elected officials who are known to be sensitive to voters when certain voting cycles occur. And so since there is a <laughs> presidential voting cycle coming up in 2008, hearing from the population saying, you're not getting reelected if you don't fix this broadband problem, that might help. Okay, I think that's all the time we've got, but thank you very much again. Okay, I stand next to this thing. Okay. I stand here. Super fail. The Dickinson College Award in memory of Joseph Priestley was struck from the original mold of a medallion created by Josiah Wedgwood in 1779 that was based on a portrait of Joseph Priestley drawn in 1775 by John Flaxman. Dr. Cerf, I am most honored and pleased to present you the Dickinson College Award in memory of Joseph Priestley and in recognition of your extraordinary achievements.
Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. Thanks for hanging around this long. Thank you very much. This is great.